Okay, everyone. Um, welcome to this session on market power and competition. This is something that a decade ago, probably an organization like Washington Center for Equitable Growth um, wouldn't necessarily have been thinking about market power. It was a conversation taking place you know, in some corners with industrial organization um, economists. It's broadened out to include industrial organization economists and people that think about things from the perspective of labor, trade, macroeconomics, and lots and lots of other topics. And Washington Center for Equitable Growth, I'm really excited, has played a role in helping to broaden out those discussions, bringing um, a range of people in to consider this broad set of issues. And that's precisely what we're going to do in today's session. We're going to have three papers, three discussants. Um, they're all 10 minutes each, except the discussant who has two papers. He gets a bit more time. And we're going to start with um, Florian Ederer from Yale University talking about um, his paper, Common Ownership, Competition, and Top Management Incentives. Um, Florian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, so I'm delighted to speak about this paper. This is joint work with Miguel Anton, Mireille Hine, and Martin Schmaltz. And uh, the, the best part of it, of course, is that we received some very generous funding from Equitable Growth uh, along the way for this project uh, that greatly helped us pull together many, many different data sources on this. So let me start and tell you what common ownership is for uh, those of you who are not familiar with this concept. Um, it's a situation uh, like this one here, where I've uh, shown you the ownership of the largest six airlines in the United States. And as you can see here, the same type of large investors show up uh, for all six of these airlines. And you know, there's Berkshire Hathaway, there's BlackRock, there's Vanguard, there's Fidelity. And you might ask yourself, well, if we all have, we, if we're all competitors, but we all have overlapping owners and we as companies should uh, act in the interest of our shareholders, how much of an interest do we actually have to compete against each other if the same owners that own us also own our direct competitors? And that essentially in a nutshell is the common ownership hypothesis. Now, common ownership is a relatively recent trend um, it's uh, risen a lot over the past decade, uh, but the common ownership hypothesis essentially says that when large investors own shares in many firms within the same industries, those firms may have a reduced incentive to compete. Now, that's good news for the firms because that can raise profits, but it's not so great news if we care about equity and growth and certainly when we care about consumers. It's a recent trend empirically. However, it has a long intellectual history uh, going back all the way to Julio Rotenberg in, uh, in the 1980s when he first started analyzing this. It's a very hot topic right now in antitrust, lots of academic and policy interest. What we do in this paper here is we look for a plausible mechanism that translates common ownership. So issues of how these companies are owned, how does that actually result in lessened competition in the product market. Because there's three things that have to be borne in mind. Number one is the investors don't that own these firms don't necessarily run these firms, but in, instead the managers of these firms run these firms. Um, BlackRock, Vanguard, and Fidelity certainly don't have that much time to directly dictate market level prices. And third, you know, some form, any form of direct collusion is illegal. So how does this lessened competition really come about? Now, you might ask us, well, why is this important from a policy perspective? Well, it's important because before we can do something about common ownership, we need to understand exactly what that mechanism is. And the FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips has expressed exactly this uh, question, but also the SEC Commissioner Robert Jackson um, raised concerns that we first before we can address common ownership with the, on the policy side, we need to understand exactly what the mechanism is. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be talking about not a direct mechanism where the investors here on the left-hand side yeah, uh, indirectly set product prices on the right-hand side, but instead I'm gonna tell you about an indirect mechanism, an indirect mechanism in which the investors set incentives for top management, where the top management then, depending on its incentives, has strong or low incentives 
to uh, rate to lower costs to improve productivity and that then filters down in the organization to pricing specialists so people who are actually in charge of these product prices and so it's an indirect way through which common ownership leads to lower managerial incentives. So in managers don't have quite so much of an incentive to improve productivity uh, in their firms. And that then results in lessened competition in these product markets and ultimately hurts consumers. So in this paper, we bring together several different fields. As Jason mentioned, this is uh, not just industrial organization, but it brings together some insights from organizational economics and also from financial economics. And the main upshot that we show both theoretically and empirically is that more common ownership at the firm level, so more overlapping owners between firms that directly compete with each other, leads to flatter managerial incentives at the top of a firm and lower firm productivity, which in turn results in higher prices and lower quantities at the industry and market level, but doesn't necessarily lead to higher markups. So it's not necessarily that these are just large profits that are here then generated, but instead you get a little bit of situation where the managers of these commonly owned firms get to live the quiet life. And we show that this plausible mechanism reconciles a bunch of seemingly conflicting empirical evidence. What we then show on the empirical analysis is that there's not just a theoretical model of all of this that explains a lot of the empirical evidence, but there's new empirical evidence that is consistent with our predictions, namely that common ownership at the firm level, so more overlap with the shareholders' uh, ownership of direct competitors also leads to lower CEO incentives. So the managerial wealth performance sensitivity, how much the wealth of CEOs is tied to good firm performance, tends to be lower in these commonly owned firms. Uh, we show this both uh, in the cross-section and time series with a panel approach, but then also with a difference in differences design that's based on index competitor additions. I'm not going to give you all the details of the theoretical model. Okay? Instead, I'm just going to tell you that this basic mechanism of common ownership leading to lower incentives okay, needs not even be to be totally direct. Okay? It, can, it need not be some, any form of conspiracy. And in fact, there is no conspiracy or collusion of any sort going on here. But instead, what happens is that these common owners are excessively deferential towards managers or even are very passive owners. So the model doesn't assume why common owners are very passive, but the way you have to think about this is very, very large asset management companies. They own many, many, many different firms. They therefore are very, very passive. They do not discipline manager to managers to really improve firm productivity or to engage in very strong competition. Okay? So you can think of these managers of these commonly owned firms as essentially enjoying the quiet life a la Bertrand Mullenathan. Okay. So the common owners, they don't really want to incur governance costs. They don't really want to engage necessarily with management because they don't have that much time. And that ends up a, a resulting in relatively low powered managerial incentives. Uh, our paper explains a ton of it, the existing empirical evidence on costs, markups, profits, prices, output, concentration, governance, entry and investment, all linked be, to common ownership. But more importantly, for this talk, I want to tell you a little bit about the red part here, which is the prediction of the theoretical model that says when there's more common ownership, the managerial incentives at the very top of the corporate pyramid should be lower. And we show that in several ways. Okay? We use a bunch of data on ownership, uh, on executive compensation, on accounting and financial data. And let me stress here, one of the innovations of this paper is that we not only have just the standard institutional ownership, but we also have 13D and 13G filings that come from private holders or block holders um, and something that really uh, equitable growth helped us in, uh, in getting the resources for scraping uh, these data. Uh, so we run a very simple empirical specification on the left-hand side is wealth performance sensitivity. You can think of this as a catch-all measure of managerial incentives, of CEO incentives. And on the right-hand side, the usual set of controls. But in addition, this common ownership variable, CEO IT, that we, our theory predicts, should have a negative impact. So beta should be negative here 
because it has a negative impact on wealth performance sensitivity. And we have, of course, a battery for robustness checks with different types of wealth performance sensitivity measures, different types of common ownership measures, different industry definitions of how we define competitors in that product space. And for all of these, basically the same set of results come through. What are these results? It's that there's a negative relationship between common ownership and wealth performance sensitivity. So here, the dependent variable again is wealth performance sensitivity. Common ownership is measured here in, uh, in, uh, in, in a percentile way. So here, a, uh, the impact of common ownership has about a half of the, the effect if you do the interquartile range. So the minus 0 0.239 here, in that first column sort of measures. If you go from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile of common ownership in the universe of firms, then that depresses everything else held constant. Common ownership, uh, wealth performance sensitivity by about half of this 0 0.23, so about 11 or 12%. Yeah. And that's true for different industry definitions. So not just crisp industry definition, but CompuStat and Holberg Phillips. Yeah. It's also true for different types of common ownership measures, not just these kappas or cosine similarities, but a bunch of other uh, common ownership measures that have been proposed over the years. It also holds for alternative wealth performance sensitivity measures. So how we measure how much managerial incentives depend on firm performance. Pretty much throughout, you get the same uh, conclusion that common ownership reduces managerial incentives. Yeah. Now, of course, you might say, oh, wait a second, you just showed us a panel and you stress the fact that these are associated and not necessarily a, a causal relationship. But we can also give these panel regressions a causal interpretation. And that uses a slightly more sophisticated framework where we use the addition of industry competitors as an exogenous shock to common ownership. Yeah. Um, it gives us some form of quasi-exogenous variation to uh, the ownership of these firms. And then we check, does that also then lead to a reduction of managerial incentives? And of course, I'm here to tell you, yes, it, indeed it does. When competitors are added to the S&P 500 index and the index incumbents are already in that index and they get a competitor added, now there's more overlap between the shareholder base of the index incumbent and the new entrant. And so you might think, okay, given that a common ownership has gone up, managerial incentives should go down. And indeed, in the year of the index addition, you don't see all that much happening to managerial incentives, but over time, as that ownership uh, change has an effect, that leads to lower managerial incentives. Okay, again, in line with the predictions of our theory. So we find very similar magnitude type results. We find a negative relationship between common ownership, manager incentives. Index additions of competitors lead to reduction of CEO wealth performance sensitivity somewhere between 10 and 16%, depending on the industry definition. And that negative effect is not there immediately, but sort of increases in magnitude for following the inclusion event. So let me say in conclusion what this paper says. It, proposes a simple mechanism through which common ownership affects product market outcomes, raises prices for consumers, and can also uh, explain a bunch of intra-industry cross-market variation in prices and several other existing empirical evidence on product market outcomes. In addition, we have empirical evidence on the negative link. However, what I want to stress also, you shouldn't come away of saying, oh, common ownership is necessarily welfare reducing or even that index funds are evil. Or what this paper really only shows that there might be some mechanisms through which common ownership has a negative impact on product market competition. And of course, that has big implications for uh, work on antitrust policy and financial regulation. Thank you very much. Look forward to Anna's comments. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So commenting is Anna Stansberry uh, from MIT. Thank you so much. What an interesting uh, presentation, Florian. And, uh, thank you for fitting so much into such a short space of time there. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to discuss this very, very interesting paper. And I'll just start by framing it as, um, as Florian did in the, in the sense that to emphasize that this is a really big and important trend that has happened 
in capital markets in recent years, the rise of common ownership um, of firms over time. Over the most recent years, the kind of most obvious phenomenon of that has been the rise of the big index funds. You know, you've got a chart on your left showing um, the share of corporate equity in the S&P 500 held by the top three index investors, going from 5% in the late 90s to 21% by the late 2010s. But that this has been part of a broader phenomenon of the increased diversification within industries of investors, both passive and active. One chart that shows you this is a recent work by Bacchus, Kahneman, and Sinkinson. And this rise in common ownership has, of course, been widely studied. And this big body of empirical evidence has started to emerge that Florian alluded to in his discussion, in his, in his presentation, on the relationship between common ownership within an industry or over time and prices, profits, potentially markups, output, firm entry or, or product entry, market entry and investment. Of course, this literature has seen big debates on the scope of these effects, the magnitude of these effects, and sometimes the sign, but there has been a growing body of empirical evidence. And the big question uh, has often been, what is the mechanism? And this is where this paper is, is really huge in its contribution because it's able to generate a model that is compelling, consistent with how we understand corporate governance relationships to work and how we understand firm management decisions and price setting decisions to work and enables us to understand how common ownership could have an anti-competitive effect given those things. So I'll just overview, um, and again, the mechanism that the paper outlines. The idea here is really that different types of shareholders have different types of incentives to push back against management. So coming from the old school of thought that there's the principal agent problem in corporate governance, such that managers have an incentive not quite to respond to shareholders' best interests, and therefore a, a sort of an activist shareholder should be trying to set highly geared, highly uh, performance sensitive managerial compensation to align interests with uh, manager interests with shareholder interests. So here, if common ownership of a company increases, and this crowds out essentially uh, activist non-diversified ownership of the company, the incentives to engage with management in setting different types of performance uh, pay structures differ. And what the authors argue is that as common ownership shares increase, managerial compensation structures become less performance sensitive. So the incentives are less steeply geared towards the, um, the uh, performance of the firm. And this in turn means that top managers have less effort, uh, have less, exert less effort to improve the productivity of the firm. Because some firm productivity improvements are going to come from cutting costs, from developing new products, and therefore by gaining market share, as there's less managerial effort to improve productivity, there's less competition across over market share and over costs with other firms in the industry. And this leads to lower industry productivity and higher industry profits. And this mechanism lets you see why it would not necessarily be in the interests of common owners to be as actively engaged in trying to make those management incentives highly geared, highly performance sensitive, because by being less active, by being less intensive in their supervision and incentive setting for managers, there's some slack that's created. The managers are making less effort to improve productivity in general, but that also enables an oligopolistic product market atmosphere to be maintained more easily, which can lead to higher overall industry profits. And the key point here is that this is a lot more plausible than a mechanism that relies on common owners directing the behavior of managers. And it's a lot more plausible than a mechanism that relies on, even in the absence of this direction, managers knowing the ownership structure of their firm and of their competitors, and therefore responding to the fact that, say, BlackRock bought a, st a, sh a stake in their competitor and therefore to maximize shareholder interest, they should be less competitive with that other company. And the, the second big portion of this contribution of the paper is they present a barrage of incredibly robust empirical evidence showing that rises in common ownership within industries and within firms over time are associated with substantially less growth in the performance sensitivity of executive pay. And so this is the table that Florian showed you here. I've highlighted the common ownership columns uh, rows here. We see it with seven other common ownership measures in the paper, with several other wealth performance sensitivity measures in the paper. And we see the 
not only the, the significance and the sign of these estimates, but also the magnitude is actually remarkably consistent across specifications. It seems like a very robust estimate that as common ownership increases with firm fixed effects, so within a firm over time, the performance sensitivity of the managerial compensation is lower than it would otherwise have been in comparable firms. And what's interesting to note, and I'll come back to this as I raise some questions towards the end, is that this comes on top of a large negative effect of institutional ownership that's been documented in the literature before when we think particularly about passive or index tracking type investors that have less uh, incentive to directly monitor and incentivize executive performance. So this common ownership effect is coming on top of any existing institutional investor effect. And the other strategy that the authors have, as, as Florian emphasized, is this IV strategy, which is even more striking, because what this tells us is, in the years after a competitor is included in the S&P 500, the other firms in that industry, who have seen no change in their ownership structure themselves, have less fast growth in their wealth performance sensitivity of their manager's pay than other firms that didn't see an inclusion of another competitor into their sector. This is striking because this focuses particularly on passive investors. This identification comes entirely from changes in the ownership structure um, from index tracker firms, which are known to be very passive investors. And so this is saying that even given a degree of passive ownership by an index tracker, once that index tracking fund is also owning your competitor, they're even less uh, incentivized to or likely to set steep performance incentives for managers. So the, the model is very compelling. The empirical evidence is very compelling. What are some questions that we might be interested in, in raising as a result of this? The first that comes to mind is the level of CEO pay. The model uh, in the paper requires that as common, in, common owners become a greater share of that firm's ownership structure, they do less monitoring of the firm. They allow the managers to live a quiet life and they're lazier investors, in, in quotes. This is predicted not only to lead to a, a lower slope of performance pay, but also a higher level. The executives are being monitored less, are being incentivized less. They're able to extract a higher level of base pay. So a natural test would be, do we see this alongside the steeper performance pay? The next question is really around the extent to which these effects are coming from passive versus active investors. Given what we know about the um, limited incentives and indeed limited actions of many passive or as particular index tracking investors to engage in strict corporate governance activity, to do to vote against management on, um, say, on pay votes. Is it plausible that we would expect index trackers to become even more passive than they would otherwise have been as their common ownership in a given sector rises? And do we have any direct evidence of this behavior? On the other hand, when we think about active investors, it seems much it seems very plausible that active investors would be deciding where to allocate their scarce um, effort on corporate governance across their portfolio and may decide to allocate that effort less towards the firms in which they have common ownership in the industry. But if that's the case, it seems like a somewhat of a blunt tool to achieve an oligopolistic product market outcome. And it will be interesting to think more about or to understand more about why active common owners would reduce performance sensitivity overall, which is going to have some negative impacts as well, rather than setting incentives that are more directly aligned. And one obvious case, and this is in the, the Bertrand Miller Nathan paper that's um, cited frequently in the study, is whether incentives should be set in terms of the industry performance as a whole rather than the firm, which would be perfectly aligned with the objectives of a common owner that owns firms across the whole industry, and would be more aligned indeed than simply sitting back and doing less to set steep incentive structures for the executives. And it would be interesting to see direct evidence of both of these. But I think taking the results of the paper as, as, as given and as proven, notwithstanding those questions, there are some broader implications that we can think about for um, understanding of corporate governance and how it plays into macro trends. The first is that this fits into a larger increase in concern generally about competition and power in product markets, in input markets and across the economy. And there have been some hypotheses that the big rise in common ownership 
has been linked to some of the big rises in equity valuations, profitability, measured markups that we've seen over recent decades. We've also seen, though, the rise in a very, very significant way of highly powered executive incentives over recent decades. So if this is the mechanism by which common ownership is primarily operating, what we would expect is that the rise in common ownership has mitigated this trend, that executive incentives would have become even steeper in the absence of the rise of common ownership, which probably suggests that the rise in common ownership in itself, if this is the mechanism through which it's operating, hard to explain, is, is, is less able to explain some of these macro trends because the rise of performance pay has in some sense outweighed any mitigating effect of common ownership on that performance pay. The second question is, what does this mean we should want in a firm's ownership structure? Is the problem of common ownership distinct from the problem generally of this um, divorce of ownership from control? Is the problem that we have too much common ownership or that we have too little activist undiversified investing that is really aligning the interests of singular block holders, uh, shareholders and the firm's performance versus common owners or index trackers or passive owners or small owners? Or is it specifically common ownership that we should be worried about? A third question, and as a labor economist who studies market power, I'm particularly interested in this, is what common ownership means for labor. Because the lazy common owner model outlined in this paper suggests that common owners will have fewer incentives to cut costs. In contrast, an active common owner model would suggest that actually common ownership would be a vehicle to enhance firms' monopsony power in labor markets and actually use that to cut labor costs relative to a counterfactual. So in some sense, the different ways in which common ownership might be working through corporate governance and firm management structures might have diametrically opposed impacts for what we might see for labor, for wages, and for wage premia. And the final point is that this fits, and I think is a really important contribution into this bigger discussion of how control and power are exerted throughout the boundaries of the firm and across the boundaries of the firm. And it fits into, I think, a big research agenda that there's a lot more to do on, and I'm excited to see more on, on the ownership structures of companies, the structures through which companies hold brands in one umbrella and exec management companies in another umbrella, franchises, the fissuring of the workplace and the increasing subcontracting of labor, and doing more to understand where in each of these long sort of product production chains, how, in some sense, artificially by boundaries of firms and by owners versus managers, how the incentive structures, the contractual structures and the ownership structures of these bigger, bigger entities and the changes that they've seen in quite seismic ways over the last 20 to 30 years affect um, broader macro outcomes. So thank you for the chance to discuss this really important paper. Uh, thank you, um, Anna. Um, we're going to move right on, um, put all three papers down on the table with all three discussants, um, but then I'm going to call on first this group to give some responses to each other and then open it up to the floor. So next is Francesco Garrido with Buyer Power um, in the Beef Industry. Francesco is from ITAM Business School. Thank you, Jason, for that introduction. Uh, so, uh, as Jason mentioned, my name is Francisco Barrio, I'm at ITAM. I'm going to be presenting buyer power in the beef packing industry. And this is joint work with Minji Kim and Nate Miller at Georgetown University and Matthew Weinberg at Ohio State. And before I start, just I wanted to thank uh, Equitable Growth for uh, hosting this conference and for their very generous funding that made this research possible. So. Now, the beef industry has been in the spotlight in recent years due to allegations of buyer power, in particular buyer power by packers, who are the intermediaries between feedlots who raise cattle and retailers who sell uh, meat to the final consumer. So industry observers have, have detected that the packer spread has increased over time. The, this means that the, the difference between the price that packers get from retailers and the price that packers pay to feedlots has been increasing over time. And this has resulted in record high profits for packers, very low prices paid to feedlots, which in turn has resulted in record bankruptcy rate among feedlots and, <clears throat> and economic dislocation among several rural communities in America. So, you might 
interpret these evolutions as simply markets operating normally. However, we do think that there is some institutional features of the meatpacking industry that deserve further antitrust scrutiny. In particular, we're going to be thinking about the role that formula contracts play in explaining the evolution of packers pet. So to do this, let me start by very briefly presenting the structure of the beef industry. So feedlots raise like cattle and sell it uh, to packers. Feedlots are very much atomized. There are several thousands of feedlots across the US. And uh, they sell cattle to packers who are very much concentrated. There's just big four big packers, Cargill, JBS, National, and Tyson. And then there's a competitive fringe. And then in exchange of this feedlot, they, the packers pay a payment, which we're gonna be calling PF here. And the packers take the live cattle and make it into boxed beef and sell it to retailers. And in exchange of that, they get a retail price, PR. So if there is any market power on the side of packers, this is gonna be expressed or represented by an increase of the spread, now which I mentioned earlier, the difference between the wholesale price PR and the payment that packers give to feedlots PF, or alternatively, as a larger markdown, which is just the packer spread uh, adjusted by marginal cost. So these are the two objects that we are gonna be sort of looking at throughout this presentation and throughout this paper. So how have packer spreads evolved over time? So in our data that goes from 2005 to 2020, packer spreads have base, were basically stable and even slightly decreasing until 2014 in a range of around uh, 40 cents per, per pound. And then in 2014, they made a drastic turn upwards. And uh, today, the level of packer spread is roughly double what it was in the previous year. Now, so roughly 80 pounds per, sorry, 80 cents per pound. So to our knowledge, there is no cost-based explanation that could account for this increase. There is no change in cost that can account for this change in the trajectory of packer spread, nor is there a concentration-based explanation. So every all merger activity that has occurred in this market, or at least the, the important merger activity, happened in 2006 or earlier. Now, so this is way before the jump in the packer spread started to take place. Uh, so, so these do not explain uh, the trajectory in packer spread. So to explain this evolution, we're gonna rely on what I mentioned earlier on formula contracts, which are a special, special feature of this market. A formula contract is an arrangement between, or an arrangement where a packer commits itself to buying X units of cattle from feedlots at a future date. And this is important. The commitment is to buy it at the future cash market or spot market price. So the cash market is what uh, people in this industry call the spot market. So in the presence of formula contracts, the profits of a packer look something like this. Now they have a markdown, which is what they make uh, in the spot market for buying cattle. Then there is a supply, which is now the function that translates the price that they pay for cattle into quantities bought. Now the supply is of course increasing in the price that packers pay to feed nuts. And then there is a formula effect. So this represents the cost of the formula commitments that the packer acquired prior to coming to the spot market. So by looking at the first order conditions, we can get a sense of how the formula contracts change the incentive of packers to bid in this market. We have the standard effect. So by increasing the price that packers offer to keep loads, they buy more units. So there is a gain in volume. Uh, there is a loss in terms of a higher price that packers have to pay for the inframarginal units. And there's this ad additional uh, formula effect that represents an increase in the cost that uh, uh, packers have to pay for their formula contract commitment, commitments, the commitments that they acquired prior to coming to the spot market. Now, so you can see from this equation that the incentive of packers to bid aggressively in the spot market to bid aggressively so to, to offer higher prices, it's actually reduced by the presence of formula contracts. 
So in short, how does Packer beating behavior change in the presence of formula contracts? So as I just mentioned, you know, formula contracts depress the incentive of the big four Packers to bid aggressively. And importantly, the size of this distortion is going to be larger when cash markets are thinner because thinner cash markets or thinner spot markets are easier to manipulate. And I'm going to show in a moment that that spot markets have actually, have actually grown thinner over the past uh, decade and a half. And additionally, the size of the distortion is going to be larger if the big four packers uh, are large relative to the whole market, which of course they are. They represent roughly 80 to 85% of all purchases of cattle in the market. So this raises the question, of course, of why do feedlots even enter into these contracts? And we're thinking of feedlots as being in a prisoner's dilemma of sorts. So each feedlot individually benefits from entering the formula contract because they get an assurance of a buyer. Now they go, rather than having to go to the cash market and risk not finding a buyer for their cattle, now they get an assurance that they will have a buyer. And of course, by doing this, they impose an externality over the rest of the feedlots in that they help they help the packers you know, manipulate the, the spot market. However, you now they don't take this effect into account. No. So there, this generates a feedback loop of sorts in which some feedlots start entering into these formula contracts. This makes cash markets thinner, which makes them easier to manipulate, which makes the risk of not finding a buyer uh, for the existing feedlots higher. So more feedlots want to enter into these formula contracts and so on and so forth. So this is in fact what we observe in the data. Now formula contracts have pretty much substituted the cash market over the past 15 or so years. So on 2005, the formula contract represented roughly 30% of all uh, feedlot transactions. Now they represent a little bit more than 65% and they have gained they have uh, gained that, that increase at the expense of cash markets that have reduced from 65 or so to the uh, to roughly 20 percent. No? So this uh, so this has of course made cash market thinner, which again makes them more easier to manipulate by by packers. So in the paper, we show some empirical evidence supporting this hypothesis. So in running regressions between 2005 and 2019, we show that a 1% increase in formula contract on a given week results in lower cash market prices uh, for around 5%. So this is consistent, of course, with our theory that more formula contract reduce the bidding um, incentives for packers and is consistent with other research. Additionally, between 2005 and 2019, the big four have decreased production capacity and lost market share. And at the same time, small packers have increased capacity and increased uh, market share. So this is, again, consistent with a, with a story where, where the big four have actually gained market power. And the plausible explanations for this are not twofold. It could be that there's collusion, or it could be that the role of formula contracts, uh, the role that formula contracts are playing. So I should note here that the reason I'm going investigation on collusion among packers by the DOJ, uh, we believe, however, that you know, even if collusion is taking place, we believe that formula contracts are a substitute for collusion in the sense, you knowing the same way that that, that Florian mentioned. Uh, of common ownership. So formula contracts allow for or make coordination easier without any grant scheme or grant um, uh, coordination among packers. Now formula contract contracts make it so make it so coordination among packers uh, arises spontaneously without any communication or any actual coordination between them. Um, so we're at the moment working on a structural model to quantify the effect of these formula contracts and to study possible remedies. And to conclude, just let me uh, reiterate what I just said. So, packer spread have been increasing over time, 
there is no possible cost-based or uh, concentration-based explanation that could account for this evolution. And we have a strong reason to believe that formula contracts may be playing a role in the in explaining these uh, this trend. So increasing formula contracts coincides with the increasing packer spread. Our theory strongly suggests a causal link between formula contracts and packer spread, and additionally, the reduced form evidence that we provided supports this hypothesis too. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to Josh's uh, comments. Uh, thank you, Francesco, for that uh, terrific presentation. And now we have, and you can correct me if I'm uh, mangling your name, Gaston Iannis on um, merger reviews and uh, prices from Northwestern. Oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, you did very well with my last name. No need to worry. Uh, so like the other presenters, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the Center for Equitable Growth uh, for providing uh, the funding that was necessary in order to make this project possible, and also for organizing this conference and getting all this great feedback. Uh, this is joint work with Vivek Bhattacharya and David Stillerman. We're trying to understand price and quantity effects of, uh, of mergers and um, consumer packaged goods in the United States. So it's long been recognized since Williamson, at least, uh, that mergers can have ambiguous effects on, on prices, on consumer surplus, and on quantities, right? The idea is that mergers allow uh, the exertion of market power, which can lead to increased prices, but mergers can sometimes also lead to cost synergies, which can lower prices and lead to higher consumer surplus. So Exante, uh, we have theory pointing to potential ambiguous effects uh, of mergers on metrics of interest. Beyond that, it's for the agencies seem to have a really difficult job here. Um, the theory is ambiguous. And then uh, identifying which mergers are going to like, lead to higher exertion of market power and which, which mergers are going to have that mitigated through synergies. Identifying that exante is a difficult thing to do. Uh, enforcement additionally is costly and the burden of proof here falls on the agencies. Um, Oh, this is a very difficult job. Uh, as a result, some of the things that, that have been done in the last 20, 30 years has been to uh, enact presumptions like HHI or Delta HHI thresholds that are meant to guide agency decisions. Uh, what our paper is trying to do is trying to contribute a little bit of evidence uh, uh, about what has been happening, uh, at least in, United, in the United States consumer packaged goods industry uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. We're going to tackle two main questions. The first are is, you know, what have been the effects of approved mergers uh, in this setting? And the second is, what can we learn from the effects of mergers that we observe uh, about the stringency of antitrust enforcement? So uh, what do we think the, the main contribution of our paper is? I think to, to frame it, it's useful to consider the three sources of selection into uh, potential analysis uh, of a merger. The first, of course, and this happens with every paper that does a merger retrospective, is that you do not observe the deals or the mergers that are never proposed by parties. Uh, we, like everyone else, uh, have the set of proposed mergers as given and can only start working from there. The second source of selection is selection into merger approval. You only observe ex post price quantity variety effects uh, for mergers that are approved, for mergers that actually go through. And that's a selective subset. And you may very well think that antitrust enforcement is precisely blocking the mergers that are the worst in this space. Uh, we're going to use a simple selection model to try to learn about the selection into merger approval margin to try to understand uh, if, if, if these arguments are, are correct or not. And finally, uh, when people have done merger retrospectives in the past, where we still have done meta-analyses of large sets of papers that have looked at one-off mergers, uh, there's the potential for selection into the analysis by researchers, right? This has been mentioned by Shapiro, Tuckman, and Hitch in the context of the uh, effects of uh, ad uh, expenditures. Um, 
to try to get around this issue, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a single industry, consumer packaged goods, and we're going to look at every single deal that has happened uh, in this industry from 2006 to 2018, conditional on the deal being large enough. We are working our way down from larger deals to smaller deals. In today's version of the talk, you'll see results with every deal that is greater than 340 million dollars. Uh, I've mentioned a lot about price effects, but we're also going to talk about quantity effects, about product assortment effects, about the timing of price changes, and about the relationship between uh, price changes and uh, market structure. So to get at what's the effect of a merger on prices or on any quantity of interest, the obvious question is, well, what's your control group? Right? What are you comparing the evolution of prices for the merging parties to? And this is a difficult thing to do. Uh, particularly in this setting, because merging parties compete with other firms in a market, and any action a merging party does is going to spill over to the optimal strategies of their rival. And as a result, their direct product market competitors, we do not think are a good control group. So we ruled out doing that fairly early in the project. The second alternative is to look at uh, markets that have been that have not been treated. Perhaps there are certain places in the United States where the merging parties were not participating prior to the merger. And you can look at price effects in those places in the United States versus everywhere else. Uh, we find we, we have some robustness checks uh, that actually use that strategy. But the issue with that strategy is that when you're looking at a particularly large merger, that strategy is, of course, unavailable to you. In the largest mergers in our sample, every single geographic market is treated. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a very simple specification. We're going to have log prices for a product at the DMA month level on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we're going to have an indicator for the merging party, for whether uh, an indicator for whether this is post-merger times the merging party, and the same indicator but for the non-merging party. And the strategy is going to be to have a very flexible DMA time trend plus UPC DMA fixed effects and seasonality fixed effects. Basically, we're gonna use the event study to try to identify the effect of the deal. Um, in our current sample, we have 108 mergers. So let me walk you through our main results. Uh, graph on the left shows the distribution of price changes. You've got in a solid black, the distribution for merging parties, and in dashed red, the distribution for non-merging parties. You can see, Main thing I, I, I take away from this plot is that this distribution is quite dispersed. It has a mean of 0.5%. So the average effect for merging parties is 0.5%. There's a fairly wide standard deviation around this. So uh, our results are showing that despite an average of 0.5%, you see quite a significant number of mergers that lead to substantial price increases. And also, uh, a substantial set of mergers that lead to price decreases. Um, if you move to quantities, uh, results are actually uh, quite similar. Again, the, the graph shows the merging parties in black and the non-merging parties in red. You see a percentage uh, change in quantities uh, that is on average negative 4%, but again, with a quite uh, significant large standard deviation. You know, our, robust, our results are actually quite robust to several other specifications. We've done this with cost and demographic controls. Uh, we've done this, like I mentioned earlier, using these untreated markets. Uh, we've looked at uh, product assortment effects. Uh, you, can, you can see how merging and non-merging parties respond to that. Uh, we've looked at the timing of price changes. We can see that uh, price increases are realized fairly quickly when they happen. Uh, we tried to look big for uh, direct energy evidences, I'm sorry, of uh, cost synergies by looking at how prices change in relation to distance to production. You know, I don't have the time to get into these, but all of these are in the paper in case you're interested in looking at those. In the last couple of minutes, let me finish up by um, making again my, my selection point. Imagine that we lived in a world where mergers effects were perfectly observable to antitrust agencies before the merger happened. And imagine that agencies operated with a threshold rule where they only let mergers through if the price change was lower than a particular value in this plot P bar. In that world, 
the distribution of price changes that we would observe is the distribution on, that is highlighted in blue. And the mean price change is marked on this graph here. Now, because the antitrust authority would only approve uh, mergers with price changes below P bar, we would not see price changes above P bar in this graph in red. And we could look at the mean delta P and say, oh, uh, actually merger policy uh, is leading to lower prices, but we are missing entirely right, uh, the deterrence effect that comes from blocking the existence of red. Uh, so we're going to try to estimate what this threshold is, uh, this P bar threshold in a, of course, richer model where agencies do not observe ex ante price changes, but rather have some belief about the true price change that is uh, measured with error, with noise. And what we find is that um, we can estimate an average price threshold of 5.6% uh, for the mergers in our sample. So it seems like on average, the agencies are beginning to act uh, when the expected price change is larger than 5.6%. This threshold is heterogeneous. It increases as a function of market size. I'm sorry, it decreases as a function of market size. It, incre it decreases when delta HHI is greater. So just to wrap up, uh, we are concluding a large scale retrospective of all uh, large major mergers in uh, US retail. We find a relatively modest average effect of 0.5% on prices and a decrease in quantities in around 5%. But of course, as you saw in plots, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity around these outcomes. Our effects or estimated effects are smaller than those that have been reported in previous meta-analyses, perhaps because of the fact that previous meta-analyses are closer to the enforcement margin than this unselected set of deals that we are working with. Uh, I've spoken about additional results that we have, effects on timing, relationship with distance changes and correlation with market structure. If you're interested in those, I encourage you to go uh, look at our paper. So with that, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to present. Great, um, thank you for that. And now finally, um, as the discussant for the last two papers we heard, um, we have Josh Feng from the University of Utah. I, I need the permission to uh, oh, okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay um great um thanks everyone um and thanks to the organizers for um inviting me to discuss these two excellent papers that touch on a lot of topics um, I think about with respect to the, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so I'll briefly recap each paper and then try to provide some um, suggestions for how the, the authors can kind of tighten, tighten the papers and really make a, a great contribution. Uh, um, so I think in his opening comments, Jason mentioned that there are these trends that um, various scholars from different perspectives have noted about increasing prices, increasing margins um, in various industries. Um, the project I'm working on that's being funded by um, this center um, looks at the drug industry. So there's been a lot of conjectures there um, that are kind of analogous to some of the, the phenomenon that the authors looked at, which is that drug prices are increasing um, and there's mergers and concentration in the industry are those tied and some people kind of make that connection so are mergers to blame for some of these um, phenomenon that we're we're seeing and so the broad goals i think of this literature i'm somewhat new to it is to understand these markets the mechanisms within these markets and um, potentially some issues with selection um, and to tie all those things together to inform um, policy in this space. And I think these two papers do a great job of um, tackling some important issues that have broad relevance for researchers studying um, markets and mergers. So we have one paper on vertical relationships, so buyer power and, and 
the associated mechanisms, and then one that's more on horizontal mergers um, and looking at product level outcomes and selection. So let me jump into the first paper, um, which is about biopower in, um, in the beef packing industry. So here I'm recapping a lot of what Francisco mentioned is the structure of the industry, which is you have a ton of feedlots, um, four really big packers, and then they sell kind of a commodity product to, to retailers. And so the paper focuses on this middle kind of part of the chain, the packers. And um, there's four big ones, as Francisco mentioned, that account for about 80% of the market. And so these are figures from the paper and Francisco's presentation. Um, the key thing here to note here is that it seems like the spread that um, the packers are earning seems to be increasing over time from say 2015 um, to present time. And maybe it's kind of grown even more in the last, um, last few years. And so that's kind of the, the motivating um, trend or empirical fact that the authors are tackling. At the same time, there's also been this increase in use of formula contracts. Uh, so you can think of this as um, contracts that reference the cash market prices or the spot uh, spot prices, but you kind of lock those quantities in ahead of time. And so that um, from you know, some of the literature on reference pricing that I'm familiar with, especially in the pharmaceutical space, um, that creates a link between two segments of the market and might distort the, the pricing in the cash market. And so explanations from the authors about what's going on. So as Francisco mentioned, this is unlikely to be about marginal cost of packing. And so uh, I'm gonna trust him on the institutional details of the industry. Often we fall back too much on marginal costs in our kind of models and estimation. And sometimes like the marginal costs vary too much. And so we'll take that as given and maybe the authors can do a little bit more to like convince more skeptical people on that. Um, so the affirmative explanation that the authors mentioned for um, explaining this increase in spread is the prevalence of these alternative marketing agree uh, agreements or um, formula contracts. So the authors have really neat data on the type of contract um, associated with each transaction, at least some kind of aggregated um, quantity data by type of contract and location. And that allows them to corroborate that these AMAs are generally using the cash market price. So that's like a kind of understated part of their, their paper. Then they kind of use, uh, try to provide some reduced form evidence um, using a weekly time series to essentially regress the cash market price change on the um, amount of uh, quantity going through these AMA um, contracts instead of the, the cash market. Um, here, I was a little bit confused about the, the effect size. So I think Francisco mentioned this like 0.05 number, and I wasn't sure um, whether that's really large. So 1% um, change, one percentage point change in the AMA quantity leads to a 5% increase in price, or whether it's like a hundred times less than that. So I think kind of um, clarifying some of that and the kind of specifications in the text would be really helpful. I think um, on my next slide, I'll mention like kind of doing something beyond just time series given the richness of the data could also really help because I think my sense is like if you do ag aggregate everything to like a time series, um, across all markets, you're probably going to kill a lot of the variation that you're, you're interested in. So I think that part could be um, kind of improved a little bit. The authors also present this nice model of oligopsony um, under AMA contracts. And so um, one kind of important um, assumption that the authors make is that each um, plant sets the same offer for all cattle in a given county. Um, so I'll kind of revisit that assumption, but under that assumption, the importance of AMAs is governed by this kind of ratio between um, the size of the cash market um, and the size of the AMA market. 
and then divided by number of packers. And this ratio can get really large if the cash market is, say, only 20% of the market and that we have very few packers as well. So kind of AMAs amplify any existing oligopsony effects by that ratio, which can get, get quite large, um, close to one or even above one in, in some kind of calibrations of, of the model. So what's happening? Um, according to the authors, essentially packers are pushing these AMAs on the, the sellers and then the AMAs amplify oligopsony effects in these cash markets um, because we don't want to compete so hard on the cash market because we know like we each have a lot of stake in the AMA segment. So you kind of know your competitors are not going to compete so hard on price. And then that kind of creates this distortion um, that the authors are pointing out that could kind of theoretically be quite large and quite important. Um, so I think some open questions and suggestions for the authors to kind of tighten their argument. I think their argument's generally quite credible. Um, so kind of first off um, is why did the spread only increase starting in 2015? So going back to this, um, these two figures, you can see formula contracts are kind of increasing kind of all the way from 2005 onwards, whereas this Packer spread has only really increased in the past kind of five to five to seven years. And I think um, there could be kind of a richer explanation incorporating um, this kind of um, the question into the analysis. Um, so maybe there's a new equilibrium once we've hit some threshold, maybe there's some nonlinear effects going on, um, especially with respect to this, this ratio. Um, I think second, improving, clarifying the reduced form evidence that would um, really kind of bolster the, the credibility of the mechanism that the, the authors are thinking about. Um, so I think the third issue, and this is probably me getting my head too much stuck in the, the farmer market, um, is kind of the nature of the referencing. So here, like the contracts reference the average cash market price across all transactions involving all um, all packers. So like to me, at least from studying pharma, like this referencing is pretty dilute. It's like the average rather than say like the best price. Um, and so I think the assumption in the model that the packer sets one cash market bid across all transactions, it might be very good. Um, and kind of, I want to trust the authors on the institutional details, but it's also likely doing a lot of the work in generating kind of the distortionary effects. So kind of some robustness around kind of modeling assumptions would be um, quite helpful. Um, some other suggestions in terms of importance of these um, AMAs. So um, maybe their quantity effects. So taking as given that you set one um, price for the cash market um, as a packer, if there's differences in cost across feedlots um, and this constant bid, then potentially their quantity effects uh, affect distortions as well from these arrangements, which could kind of be more direct um, effects on on welfare and maybe like feedlot bankruptcies and things like that that are that um, Francisco mentioned. Um, and finally, I mean, I don't necessarily have a good answer. So why did AMAs go up so much from 05 to 2015, tying it back to the theme of the conference? Maybe it's because of some of these mergers that happened in the, uh, like around 2007, I think, um, there were two or three um, big mergers. So maybe there's some inertia in kind of contracting practices, plus these mergers. And what the authors might be picking up on is some of these long run effects of mergers. But again, I don't know so much about these, these contracts and maybe kind of theory suggests other mechanisms beyond kind of concentration that drive the increase in AMAs. But I think that would be great, but it's certainly not necessary to complete the paper. Um, so let me move on to the second paper, um, which is about retail um, mergers or consumer packaged goods mergers. So the motivation, one motivation the authors give is that their worries about selection into uh, merger retrospectives. So I think in some meta studies, um, people have found like an 8% price effect from, from mergers. And so what the author's solution for this is 
is to assess all large mergers in the consumer packaged goods space. And here they're exploiting um, very rich um, scanner data from Nielsen, which many of you um, are likely familiar with. And so here they've contrast, uh, constructed a sample of 108 mergers from 2007 to 2018, roughly kind of aligning with um, the period of um, data availability. And so the authors have done a really impressive job of data collection to provide a complete picture of what's going on. So they've done a more careful job with ownership than say I would do um, looking at these, these markets. They've done a great job um, kind of mapping commodities to markets and thinking about input commodity prices. Uh, they've done some on the location of production, which kind of was really impressive. And I think I'll highlight that in my, in my comments. Um, and they also have some data on enforcement actions. Second, they did a really careful job of manually classifying product markets. So I call this Nielsen Plus. Um, so again, like the kind of uncareful way to do this would be just to use the Nielsen um, product categories. But what they've done is kind of done a more careful manual classification to really get at what goods are, are truly substitutes. And then they try a few different empirical strategies. I've said two here, but actually they've done a bunch of different things. Um, but essentially it's kind of deviations of quantities from trends and sometimes using small markets as, as the control group. And so what the authors find is that the effects of mergers is um, actually quite minimal. Um, so there is a big spread as um, Gaston showed in this, um, in this picture, in this figure, there's a huge spread in the, um, average, in the price effect, but the average is actually quite small. Um, they also find a kind of average drop in quantities, which I'll kind of revisit in my comments, which I found um, quite interesting as well. The authors then note kind of the timing of some of these effects. So in the group of mergers that kind of generate high price effects, there's like an immediate jump in the price, which suggests maybe pricing is quite flexible. So you exert your market power right after the merger happens. So this is kind of the second figure here. Um, for the group of mergers where the price goes down, um, the author suggests that it's actually likely to be synergies kicking in over time that allows the firm to um, reduce their prices. Um, and so they even provide direct evidence from the location of production facilities, which I found to be um, quite, uh, quite interesting and quite uh, impressive. Uh, and then at the end, the authors do a little bit to model the behavior of regulators, and which I found um, to be also quite important for um, people working in the area. It's certainly come up as I've thought about um, mergers in pharmaceuticals. Um, and I think the authors are in the process of collecting more data on withdrawn deals. Right now, they're looking just at the deals where the regulator suggested some remedies. So some again, some open questions and suggestions for the authors to kind of improve their already very uh, very good paper. Um, so I think the distance to production facility thing is kind of very cool. And maybe Gaston didn't give himself enough credit for, for all the work that went into that. Um, one, maybe just a little bit more work kind of controlling for other factors that this could be proxying for um, might, be, uh, might be useful if they want to play up this particular aspect of their analysis. Um, and the same second question that pops into my head is whether you know, these production facility locations can be a factor used in merge review or kind of used in predicting the effects of, of mergers, especially if you think you know, you're able to ex ante look and see, oh, which of these two types is the merger more likely, more likely to be. Um, the second kind of comment this this comes from more just like my teaching strategy to students here um, we teach kind of about industry life cycles and selection into into mergers um, are these big mergers likely to happen in declining product areas um, so we see decreasing quantity on average uh, for these mergers not just for the ones that price goes up uh, I could be wrong about that um, kind of 
related to that, like it would be nice to kind of maybe group these by both P and Q effects. Um, and so you can think about as like a business school two by two or kind of a revenue response distribution, um, thinking a little bit about consumer welfare, like when the prices go down in these like low, um, low price change areas, like does that actually lead to um, improved consumer welfare or is something else kind of going on um, in the space? So kind of thinking more about uh, the richness that the authors already constructed this kind of rich structure. So exploiting that to kind of tell a more detailed story about what's going on on in these mergers would be help, uh, helpful. Um, on the regulator behavior, the authors currently have a small set of mergers. Um, so I think the authors are doing more to collect data here and potentially looking at smaller mergers that fall under regulatory thresholds, which has been done in the literature could be kind of another way to um, build data into their existing existing estimation to get a, a better sense of what's what's happening. Um, and this, I think this part is quite important because it offers a way for others working in the area to use the machinery um, when studying mergers to incorporate the role of regulators, which um, like in preliminary work that um, we've done on our project, we do find the regulators seem to know something and like do have a have an impact on on which uh so uh, regulators matter in some sense and i think the authors have formalized this and that could be quite important um minor thing again maybe my head stuck in the pharma space um i think the authors are focusing on products that are kind of in overlapping um areas uh, kind of overlapping products involved in the mergers but maybe there's also an effect on all products owned by the firm, either through negotiations or through um, other effects that might be might be happening. Um, and that might be interesting for the, the authors to look at just because they mentioned a lot of these mergers are conglomerate mergers. So there's lots of products involved. Um, so to wrap up, um, these are two excellent papers that highlight policy relevant mechanisms, um, selection and heterogeneity in, in merger effects. Um, so like the a AMA is particularly important because um, the existence or prevalence of, of these contracts is relevant for merger review because they can amplify buyer power. Um, the heterogeneity in if price effects of mergers and regulator behavior is, are also important points um, to make. And this selection into um, academic research, which the authors pointed out as well, could be quite um, important. And so I'd encourage the authors to do a bit more work to select, solidify the understanding of their settings, highlight the importance of their settings, both quantitative and kind of qualitative, and then that might really help others studying um, other industries. So thank you. Great. Um, thank you for that uh, great discussion, Josh. So what I'm going to do, um, and if there are any questions, people in the audience should feel free to ask them through the online platform. But um, what I'd like to do is hear from the authors in um, reverse order, just some responses to the discussants, um, broader points and the like. So we'll start with Gaston. Well, first, just say thanks to Josh. Uh, I think he did an amazing job discussing the paper and the points that he brings up are very interesting. Uh, like Josh suggested, we, I didn't really have in a 10 minute talk much time to talk about the, the distance stuff. Uh, what we did is collected data about production facilities, uh, basically from hodgepodge sources, uh, FDA inspection reports, uh, 10K filings, general Googling, uh, the army of undergraduate students that we hired thanks to equitable growth uh, funding, uh, was really busy on that. And yeah, it, it allows us to study whether the price change at the market level, product market level, uh, correlates with the change in the distance to production facilities. And we find that it does uh, when distance falls more, when distance to the nearest production facility falls more, uh, prices fall more as well. Uh, it's an, uh, it, it's a, a result that we're working to dig more about on. I think Josh suggested it could be vulnerable to confounds. So 
I don't want to draw too much emphasis on it, but but it's something that that, that we're working on uh, and that we're excited about for the next revision of the paper. So thanks for bringing that. Great, um, Francesca. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, uh, Josh, for those comments. So now we're gonna try to do a better job at clarifying some of those interpretations of our results. So uh, about the the effect of formula contracts in our regression analysis. So we find that an increase in one percent on formula contracts um, decreases prices by five percent. Now that is. It is the first interpretation that you mentioned. So it's a very, very large effect. Um, now I should point out here that we're not thinking that this sort of effect extrapolates uh, nicely. You know, if you increase formula contracts by 30%, that would imply a, a huge reduction in prices that we do not really expect to happen. Also, it, it's a local estimate and there's probably uh, some non-linearities going on here that we're not capturing in our in our estimation. And finally, I want a, a word about the model that of course I did not have time to really uh, go into it. Now there is there is a lot more richness to what's going on in this industry that I than where I was able to to point out during the presentation. Now, in particular geographic competition is very important because the cost of of transporting cattle around are very high so feedlots usually have like one or two options available to to sell their cattle to rather than the big four that we actually see so local concentration is a lot higher and what we do to to allow you know, for that local competition to to manifest itself in the model is that each plant is able to set its own price. Uh, in the version that you read, we're still working throughout that model. So in the version that you read, we'll probably have constant prices along, along plants within a, a packer. And that is something that we're working on relaxing basically. Now, so different plants will be able to charge different prices to uh, feedlots coming from different counties basically. Um, yeah, that, that's that, what I wanted to say about that. Thank you again, Josh, for those comments. And if there are any other questions, I'll be happy to take them. Great, terrific. Um, Florian. Well, I, I'm delighted uh, about the terrific discussion that Anna gave. I'm going to hire her to expose it as clearly as she did all of my papers. Um, the I have no further comments other than to say this. Um, a lot of exciting work on common ownership happening precisely in the directions that Anna raised towards the end on what this means for labor market power. Jose Azar and uh, Bruno Pellegrino and others have uh, um, uh, new work on that. Uh, and uh, hopefully with the support from equitable growth, we can do more on truly identifying what the mechanism is and what that what common ownership means for the distribution of wealth and welfare in the economy. Um, Florian, um, not to do another round of pressing you, but um, what is there any sort of preliminary takeaway? Because I was listening to your presentation and also sitting there thinking, oh, this may be great for workers. No one's going to be trying to squeeze them. And fortunately, this isn't private equity where you have a ruthless owner who's incredibly focused on a compensation package for a CEO to get them to maximize everything. Yeah, um, so I should, so. I, it, that's a great question. Um, I should uh, emphasize here, there's two directions in which this can go. Now our model, as Anna correctly pointed out, has indeed this interpretation that you get a little bit a, a weaker effect of corporate governance. You don't quite get as much squeezing or costs and productivity and, that might be a positive effect for workers. However, what our paper does not analyze at all is the effect, the direct labor market effect of common ownership. So just like common ownership leads to a lessening of product market competition, so essentially enhanced oligopoly effects, you also get enhanced oligopsony effects with common ownership. 
Um, so here I'm speaking somewhat out of turn because it's not directly my own work on this, but um, Aaron Sojourner and uh, Jose Azar have a new paper that looks theoretically at the effect of common ownership on labor uh, markets and finds theoretically that that enhances oligopsony power and also empirically seems to be linked to lower wage growth and also lower wages. So the idea that being that the same types of firms that have already a lot of labor market power are now going to have even more labor market power because of the overlap in their investors and hence that leads to lower wages uh, for workers. I should stress that this is preliminary work. Um, it's currently ongoing, but uh, it certainly raises a lot of the other interesting questions of well, what the welfare effect of com effects of common ownership are. Great. Um, now I wanted to sort of do an open round of anyone asking questions to anyone else who has presented a paper, discussed a paper, um, want to do another round on um, the discussion. So just, I don't know, start talking. And if two people start talking at once, I'll worry about it. I'd like to, um, thanks, Jason and, and Florian, and uh, thanks for the nice words, Florian, about the discussion. Um, I'd like to come on to this point on labor, um, if I may, since we're on that already, because um, this the, this new paper that's very interesting that uh, Florian mentioned by um, Azar, Q and Sojourner does find these negative effects of common ownership on earnings in labor markets. But it's my understanding that the mechanisms are diametrically opposed, and maybe I've misunderstood, but that either common ownership is acting to reduce, um, in the way that Florian's paper alleges, like acting to reduce investor oversight of managers and therefore giving, man you know, returning us to the days of managerial capitalism and the divorce of ownership and control, and maybe more slack for workers, along with whatever other productivity and profit mar uh, product market problems come there. Or it's happening through this channel where um, direct direct influence or control from owners is leading to firms to be able to exert more oligopsony power, more oligopoly power. Am I misunderstanding or are those are those mutually conflicting um, stories? No, it, uh, I completely agree with you. I wouldn't say that they're mutually conflicting stories. I think they are complementary stories in the sense that there are different mechanisms of common ownership. So the one that we highlight in particular is one this indirect one, passive one that has in, that can explain a lot of the evidence on the product market side. Mm -hmm. Now we're very very careful uh, to stress that this is just one mechanism. Mm -hmm. So there are these very very there are these instances of very very active intervention of common owners in the product market. Um, I can point here in particular to a paper by my former graduate student, Nathan Shikita. He has a wonderful paper in the Journal of Competition Policy um, and Law and Competition Policy that just outlines uh, a bunch of different anecdotes from public sources of uh, investors actively engaging, uh, of common owners actively engaging in corporate governance and influencing product markets. There's also one labor example in there. So that would speak very okay. much to this type of thing. But you're absolutely right, Anna. Uh, the, these two mechanisms can have differential effects. And in the product market one, it has you know, sort of this lessening of productivity that then leads to higher prices. But I think they can very much coexist. Uh, and so having found one mechanism, I think, explains what, what we know about certain aspects of common ownership, but certainly does not explain everything. So as much as we try to get that across with that big table that really highlights uh, and says, look, we can explain all, all these things, there's some evidence that our model cannot explain. No, that makes total sense. Thank you. And yeah, to be clear, I, I, I didn't mean mutually conflicting in all respects, because obviously in the product market respect, a lot of these different mechanisms will work in the same direction. But in the input market, it seems less clear to me that they might they might push in opposite directions. But that's, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that the paper by uh, Shikita. I've noted that down. Thanks. Great. Other discussants, panelists that have questions for each other? <laughs> <laughs> 
if there aren't, and I'm not seeing questions from the audience, um, you know, might uh, let everyone have an extra five minutes of their day, but want to do see if there's any final takers. And by the way, I think I'm looking correctly at questions from the audience. It's possible I'm having a tech issue and missing them, um, in which case I apologize to the audience. Um, but otherwise, um, I want to thank everyone for these three papers, these um, three discussions, which means Fred gets double thanked. And it really sort of, I think, lived up to the purpose of what equitable growth is trying to accomplish of getting you know different types of um, you know, uh, of research programs and economics to link up to each other. I think all three of these papers in some ways weren't quite at the, you know, what exactly does it mean for public policy stage? And if I'd had more questions, would have tried to push you on speculating on that. Um, but to the degree the answer to your question was more research is needed, um, which I think Florian explicitly said in his area, um, in a lot of these topics that that might be the right answer, at least for now. So, um, thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks to our paper writers and discussants. And um, this session is adjourned.